you know, me solo, no. I mean, I'll do like 250 or 300, but I don't even want to pay that sometimes. Right? No, I, mean, I was like full solo. I'm like 750 bucks, man. Yeah. I don't want to play a cocktail party. Well, there you if go. If they want to pay yeah. me to play a cocktail yeah. party, well, there I'll you do. go. And I'll you never know. Sometimes they may just, oh, yeah, sure, we got a lot of money, whatever. Yeah. Hey, and you I've, sound good. I've, I've run into that, you know, where people are like, all right. And then, yeah, that's the thing. That's the price. If you don't really want to do it, there's always a price, though, so it's just like, yeah, we just yeah. put the price there, and then most, like, most likely you won't do it. There's this <laughs> uh, problem, triangle that I, I got from this uh, publicist that I met at the the Book Baby conference, uh, independent publishers and stuff, you know, or, 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 or uh, self-publishing conference by Book Baby, CD Baby, CD Baby affiliate. <laughs> And she's actually from Chicago, and so then I went on her podcast talking about my book and about being an independent author and musician. And she talked about this thing she got from some some uh, woman in marketing that said, you have a triangle, and it's basically, if you get two out of three corners on the triangle, take the gig. Right. And it's like, is it fun? Does it pay? Will it enhance your brand? Yeah, you know? yeah. And if you get two out of three of those, you're good. Yeah. You know? Little close to you. Shit, I mean, honestly, the pay, you can just get one corner. Really, if the pay's good. Yeah, if the pay's good, <laughs> everybody's yeah. got a price. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need the fun or a brand enhancement, but yeah, if it was like $700 for a unless solo show, but yes. Unless it's yes. Phil will pay you $10,000 mm-hmm. to play a Trump rally, I'll be like, uh, you Ooh. Know, no, I'll pass Ooh. on that. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, 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 I'm going to pass on that. I yeah. I I'd like ten. Th- I really would like $10,000, but. How about, uh, how about you pay me $10,000? And for a week, I won't complain about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, Actually, I don't really complain much anyway. I don't do any good. No, yeah. Right. Engage people in positive dialogues. <sighs> so we're ready to roll? We are all set. All right, man. All right, man. Oh, there's no water around me there. I should have brought some. But there's there's yeah. water. There's like a bathroom. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no big deal. You know, if, I get, if I get really parched, I'll take a water break. <laughs> yeah, we'll put everything on pause. Yeah. Is, that, is that thing recording? It's rolling, yeah. Oh, okay. We're rolling. Wow, we're rolling. Uh, Red light fever. Uh, That's what Ted calls it, right? What's that? Ted, when, when, oh. As soon as they turn on the camera, yeah, freeze. With, with bands of yeah. freezing red light fever. Actually, yeah. before you do that, it's a little. Or should we just lean? You could. Yeah. I feel like that would be super uncomfortable for 45 minutes. Yeah. Well, if you're cool, you just kind of naturally lean. Well, there you sit, go. You know? Right, exactly. I mean, right. If we're cool, we're cool. It's different. Good posture is not cool. <laughs> yeah, right. That's yeah. That's why my back hurts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just wait till you're my age. Well, I right. will wait. Yeah. I will. I will. Hey, man. <laughs> people complain about getting older. It's a lot better than the uh, alternate possibility. Yeah, exactly. Die. Yeah, know. yeah. My sister got a moving violation yesterday in Wyoming. It's, she said 51 years without a moving wow. violation. That's impressive. And I, I, was, I had to do the math. I'm like, I'm 53. She was 14 when I was born. My God, she'd be like, she never got a moving violation. And she was, uh, you know, a hard party and hippie and all. I'm like, wow, she got away with everything. That's yeah. cool. And now we got that on camera. Well, she uh-huh. knows. She knows <laughs> who she is. Um, all right, shall we? You ready to go? All right. What's happening? Welcome to the Working Circle, my brand new monthly podcast. Once a month, I'll be sitting with artists and music business professionals. We'll talk about their stories, successes, and the things that they learned along the way to help you learn from people that have made a career in the music business as independents, as music entrepreneurs. In this first season, The focus will be on building a career from the ground up. How to get started and how to progress throughout the difficult stages and different stages of a career as an independent musician. So today, let's start with the foundation. Establishing yourself as a musician and forming a band. We're getting the band back together, man. For those of you who have played and want to make the jump into being a musician, this will help you get started. Today's guest is a longtime friend of mine, actually, Mark Taylor of Chicago based Rolling Stones cover band Rocks Off, as well as being a singer songwriter with an album out. 
As part of the band Rocks Off, Mark has played festivals and major venues, including Chicago's House of Blues. So I have a list of questions, Mark. How's it going, man? Pretty good. How are you? Great, man. It's great to see you. It's good to be here. So we're gonna we're gonna ask uh, uh, I'm gonna ask all these questions that you just saw about five minutes before we hit record. Yeah, I'll do my best. All right, that's the way it works. Everyone's story begins with what got them into music. So tell me about when you knew you wanted to be a musician. Uh, I've always loved music because you know it surrounds us our whole lives. I mean, as long as you're living the right kind of life, I suppose. You know, uh, but yeah, you, you know, parents listening to it on the radio in the car, uh, always loved it. But it wasn't until I guess maybe my teenage years that I found my own music that I enjoyed. Like, uh, you know, I was introduced to Jimi Hendrix, and when I got into Nirvana, you know, the two kind of different ends of the spectrum. But I would envision myself, you know, singing, playing guitar, you know, but more of like a fantasy type thing. You know, I was like, oh, that'd be so cool if I could do that. And uh, it wasn't really until my 20s I realized that I could sing. I tried to play guitar back as a teenager. It was so-so. It was, this was before your, your great tutelage. Oh, yes. That took my guitar skills, you know, to where they uh, needed to be. But, um, yeah, it wasn't until my 20s I realized, oh, I can sing. Uh, people, you know, you do karaoke and all people tell you, hey, you got that good voice. And it's more than just patting on the back and being nice. And uh, so I started realizing, oh, maybe I, I can do this. Um, Maybe I, I, I can be a musician, I can sing, play guitar, you know, and it did take some work. But um, I would say at some point, like early to mid-20s is when it's sort of uh, something I realized that um, I could possibly do that I really would like to do uh, beyond just like, you know, dreams of a teenager. Yeah, the, the dreams of the teenager are many. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, at that point, you know. Yeah. Well, you were talking about that. You know, the, the being when I was a teenager, I'm thinking. I, I wonder how many teenage boys have had that dream when they listen to their favorite music. I don't yeah. Know, I'd say, yeah. Yeah. Them, yeah. Totally. They, they yeah. Decided to pursue it. Now, you since you mentioned tutelage, um, so for our listeners, Mark, uh, a long time ago, uh, came to me. For long, long time ago. Long time. Back when I was a boy. More than a decade. That's right. Yeah. Uh, came to me for uh, vocal coaching, and then we worked on uh, guitar. I think there was a little bit of songwriting tips going in there too. Um, so, uh, uh, just be, like I said, because you mentioned that, um, would you say that getting training is absolutely an essential part of uh, making a career in music? Uh, uh, and if so, why or? Uh, what kind of training should you make sure you have? You um, take it either way. You know, for me, it was essential because um, doing it on my own, I was only kind of sort of, you know, half-assed, and 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 and, 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 and there's so much available on YouTube now. I mean, uh, I'm trying to teach myself piano, and mm -hmm. I'm finally committing more to it. And YouTube's just full of a bunch of stuff you can learn. But I still well, think YouTube is full of a lot of stuff. yeah, it's full of a lot of stuff. Yeah. I mean, but. Uh, having a, a you know uh, an experienced teacher as a guide, and also um, I felt that too that doing the weekly classes that you're paying for, uh, you got to be on on it. You can't just you know not do it and show up. I mean, you can, and then you sort of feel embarrassed that you didn't do your homework or you're you're not performing well in front of the teacher, and you're wasting your money and, and mm -hmm. everyone's time. Yeah. yeah. So that that kind of holds you to a a level of um, commitment. Um, and, and, and keeps you on track. And that's what I found that I needed that I previously would like. I'd play guitar for maybe a couple months, then I wouldn't. And then, it, you know, it was just more of a nice, consistent weekly thing. And also, yeah, I, I, I had reached the point where I, this is what I really wanted. So, you know, it was, it was a combination of, yes, I want this. And then I got these weekly classes that's kind of keeping me on track. And, uh, if you can do it without that, you know, more power to you. But I needed the discipline and the, and the, and the consistency and, you know, someone there to, to, you know, like a person. Yeah, YouTube videos are good, but the interactions, questions, the, you know, confidence boosting that you need or whatever when you're discouraged. Well, you know, and I, and I have YouTube videos, but I try to throw in occasionally with those or anytime anybody brings up YouTube or any other video platform um, that they should be supplemental, that the one-on-one -on -one interaction of somebody who's coaching you through the process is extremely important. And I heard a really great example, too. Uh, it's funny how musicians are like, oh, I can do it all on my own. Yeah, how did that, you know, did, did Michael Jordan become a great basketball player all on his own? Yeah, no. Of course not. 
So the great athletes at the top of their game have coaches. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and then from my own personal experience in that, uh, too, the same, similar thing. It was like, well, I needed to, the, the, to be accountable, held accountable. But there were also things that I didn't know I needed to, need, needed to know. There were gaps yeah. in the knowledge. So it was going and, and, and sorting that out helped a ton. All right, so um, we know when you decided you needed to be a musician. Uh, was Rocks Off your first band, or give us a little history there? It was not. Um, I had tried out for a couple. Once I, um, actually it's funny, before I, the, the, the reason I went to you for vocal lessons, because I was trying out and it wasn't really happening, and one guy, you know, was like, you got a good voice, but you need to work on intonation and this and that, whatever. And when I was singing karaoke, I was like three songs, four songs, like voice would be kind of like gone. So I was like, I need to like learn how to sing. Um, and, and once I took the vocal lessons, uh, I tried out for a band and it, uh, it worked out. It wasn't Rock Soft, it was another Stones band that was looking for a singer, Craigslist ad I, that I answered. And I uh, was just looking to be a singer in a band. I'm like, yeah, Rolling Stones, they're pretty good. Mick Jagger, I want to be a front man. He's one of the best. And so that was my first band. I was a little late starter, I was 27 or so when I finally got into that. And um, I looked at it initially like, well, just be in a band, see where it goes in a year or two, and then move on to something else and, and, and or whatever. And then it just turned into about seven or eight years, and I, I changed things up, started a different uh, Rolling Stones band that was that, that became Rock Stop. I took one of the members, uh, the guitar player from the first band, transferred over to the uh, Rock Stop, but it was mostly a new band. Did that other band uh, dissolve? Uh, or did you just find that it could be put together better? Did you start to recognize uh, where improvements could be made and that you were the person to make those improvements? Any yeah, of those yes, yes. It, it, there was limitations that were that the band had, um, you know, due to just members not being where I want, you know, musically just wasn't what I wanted it to be. Uh, and and you know, it worked. We still got a lot of good gigs and did some good things, but I just felt there could be more, it could be better. And I, you know, I, I kind of left it and dissolved it sort of, and then formed, found, found new players and, uh, and, and now the musicianship and everything of the band is, is exactly where I want it to be. And it's a lot better, but it's a tough decision to do it because you're in a band that it's working, you but not, not exactly not as well as you want, you know, and you're just kind of... There's, and there's, there's a level of connection with anybody that you're playing, with whom you're playing music. Uh, you have, there's an element of trust developed between you. There's a certain amount of vulnerability everybody's sharing with each other. Uh, there, these connections evolve, whether you intend they do or not, whether these are people you would even hang out with or not. You develop these connections. So it can be difficult to go and make those changes. What, uh, what was the best reason you can think of for making those changes other than you said, well, the musicianship wasn't what you thought it should be or the, the show could have been better? Why does that matter? Tell people, why does that matter that the show could be better? Because um, you want to, you want to like, well, at least me, I want to put on the best show I can. I want to, you know, it's, it's show business. I like to show off. I want to, I want to, I want to have behind me or whatever I'm doing, I want to say, this is me doing the best thing I can. And, and I felt it was a little uneven with the band, you know, and I just felt like that this band could be better. And when I play a show, I want to be able to uh, probably brag about, you know, this band or whatever. And just, hey, look at us. This is, this, this is what we're doing. This is what we're throwing at you. And I love it. And I'm proud of it. And the way things were, I was like, yeah, it's good. But, and, and, and it just, the, the people weren't on the same level. And it was just sort of, you know, just wasn't what I wanted it to be. So you want your audience to have a good show? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You said, yeah. You said I, I, it's not just me, but, but, but yeah, I, but, I loved, I, I, I love to show off. It's a big reason a lot of artists get on stage, but not a lot yeah. of introverted performers. Yeah, you know. But once we get on that stage, that element does come out, right? And and, but yes, we want because we have pride in our work, right? Yeah. So I'm I'm not going to present something that sucks. Yeah. You know why would I why would I or, do that or to half myself sucks or whatever you know? Yeah. Do that to my yeah. listeners or do that to my audience. People are expecting something. So if you have any pride in your work, whatever you do, uh, it makes the the job more enjoyable because you're constantly in in a uh, uh, the process of improvement. You know, you, you as long as you are continuing to have pride in, in your work and a, and a, a, a 
purpose behind it. You didn't become a musician because you said, well, like being an accountant, I can get a stable job <laughs> for 40 years and retire at 65. Well, that's not that. Five. No, no. Right, you know, I worry about retirement, but well, that's another subject. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to do a whole thing on retiring as yeah, a musician. Yeah. Don't. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to retire in Hawaii and just play the um, uh, 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 hotels and beaches They're and stuff. opening a Disney resort yeah. there. They did. They opened a Disney resort there. My wife just did a, 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 oh, really? a, a acting gig promoting it recently. Yeah. Right. So they got a Hawaii Disney resort. So there you go. They'll yeah. Be for you, man. Maybe, I could, maybe I could be like Mickey Mouse or something and just wear a costume. Could, you could, you could, Mickey Jagger. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah we could. got to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, what, now... How do you manage with all the creative differences within the band now? You say you brought the, the musicianship up. Uh, you obviously demand something of, of, of these guys. All guy band? That's yeah, all guy band. Okay, yeah. so I want to make sure I got it right. They call them guys and maybe, you know. Yeah. Or something. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, so how do you, how do you get something out of them? How do you uh, motivate them other than, you know, I'm paying the bills? Uh, how do you deal with the creative differences, etc.? Walk, walk through the management of the group a little bit. Well, number one, uh, you want to have people around you that have a similar level of pride. Uh, so therefore, it's not too difficult to to get out of them what you what you want because they also uh, you know want people on the same page uh, with that. And 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 creatively, I mean, this is this is a, a Rolling Stones tribute band. There's not really anything creative. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say we are playing other people's music, but you know how we do it and which songs we choose, you know, and what kind of era do we want to represent? I guess would be you know the the creative uh, parts, I suppose. And you guys but, represent a specific era of, of the Stones. Yeah, you? we try to like you know uh, late sixties, early seventies, Mick, Mick Taylor era era. Stop, stop, stop it! Start me up. Yep, that's where it's we stop. It's I, it stops. I, I stop at nineteen eighty one. Tap to you. People say, "Oh, why don't you play like?" Eh. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, but that, that that's a decision that has to be made, and everyone's on most everyone's on board with it. I mean, we we, we, we do have a couple of new we do one new song, but I'm just like I don't like it as much. But uh, uh, <laughs> that that's a thing. But um, you, you try to compromise as always. I mean, bands and relationships. Uh, band uh, being a band is a relationship, uh, yeah. you know, and it's like a relationship with like four or five people, which can be complicated, but. Uh, like in any relationship you have with friends or you know significant others, you, you want people that you sort of you know, you know, gel with to an extent. Similar mindsets, you know, everyone's gonna have their differences of opinions, but you try to compromise, try to give everybody you know a little bit of what they want. In general, everyone kind of wants the same thing. You know, just play good music that that the audience enjoys, that we enjoy. Um, yeah, that's the thing too with some of the song choices. Like if I'm not having fun with it, I don't really like it. I don't really want to do it. I'm the one that's got to sell it. Out there. Well, so. yeah, and if you're not having fun, why, why, no, again, yeah. why phone it in for the? It's got to be fun. Yeah, phoning in is you know people yeah, can see the phoning in. They can see they can yeah. see your phone. Yeah, yeah. You're sitting there, they see the phone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they can see they can see your fake in it, right? Yeah. And and what's interesting when with that kind of uh, with that aspect of it is when you are not into it, your audience isn't sitting there going, I know exactly what's wrong. Yeah. You know, he's not into it, or I know what they, oh, like, they don't know what it is, they just know if it is. He was a little off or something. Yeah, yeah, they're like, I don't know, yeah. they, they seem like they're really good, but it's not doing anything for me. And and that's very often because the, the performer isn't isn't there, isn't, isn't he emotionally involved, or isn't uh, committed uh, to, to the, the song. You know, what you're saying about compromise, too, I mean, it's, it's like when, in music, uh, from a standpoint of musicianship and working in a band, we use the, the, the phrase give and take a lot. Uh, the, you know, the uh, song starts with a, a bass line and uh, the bass player uh, hands it over to the drummer and then the uh, guitarist takes it from there. There's, you know, so there's this, this communication going on through the music at all times. And if you all are not in there together, then it's like... Uh, Five people in five different bands, so the, 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 the you know the same things that allow you to collaborate as a musical unit, as one giant instrument, so to speak, are the things that can allow you to collaborate as a business entity, which you are, correct? Yeah, yeah. We're, you got, you know, we you make, make money. You make a living. I make a living doing this. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what about the other guys? Are they pros? Are they? Uh, uh like, yeah, yeah. Um, 
drummer. And they're, and they're, they're professional by the quality of work that they do. Yeah. I always stress that professional is an attitude as much as anything, but in this case, I'm using pro from the standpoint, are they full-time musicians? Um, we have a couple, like, you know, rotating bass players, and, and our and guitar player is, like, retired. But, so, you know, he's he's retired uh, pro musician now. I mean, he definitely was in the past and stuff. Um, drummer is, I am guitar player. So, yeah, mo most of the band is, and then we got a couple guys, you know, that maybe have some day jobs. But, in bring general, like, being a horn section, too. So yeah, no, you know, we have a couple different horn sections, depending on availability. You know, some of those guys might have might have jobs. I don't know everybody's story. But, uh, but the keyboard player that we, you know, tend to use, he's pro. Like, you know, it's a lot of pro guys that are, this is what they do. And, and because they do it for a living, they're good. You know, it's, it's, when you do it all the time, you, you, get, you get a lot better at it. it you, can't, you can't work in a city like Chicago and not be pretty damn good to make a living because you can go into a dive bar and still hear quality music. Yeah. You know? Sure, you can find some crappy music too. Yeah, you know, but depends you on can, what bars, but yeah, there's a lot, I mean, there's a the great thing about Chicago, there's a lot of opportunity, uh, I think, this is a city I'm making a music living in, and I, I don't know if other cities would be. I mean, maybe I could, but the fact that Chicago has so many, you know, suburbs and everything that has all these bars, and there's a lot of music in all these bars. It, you know, it's and and it's like you know, L.A., Nashville. It's kind of like well, LA's big, but still, there's a concentration of, of of great players and singers and everybody, and it's it's hard for you to be, you know, stick your head out above the crowd. Where Chicago, it's a nice balance of Lots of work, lots of talented people, and it's not like cutthroat sort of fighting for uh, for stuff. I mean, I know a lot of other guys that, similar to me, are playing much acoustic shows and making a living doing it. So there's lots of opportunity out there in Chicago. Well, the one thing about Chicago that I've mentioned before with people, uh, both in, like, in, in my other podcast or when I'm inter being interviewed myself and that sort of stuff, or, or coaching people, uh, constantly comes up. Chicago music, and one thing that, that I've always observed about it is Chicago enjoys the process, too. Uh, we like a, a, a professional-looking show, um, but it doesn't have to be Hollywood polish or Nashville polish. Yeah. We like the process. We like it to be, like, you know, the Chicago term, a regular guy, you know. Like, regular guy. Like a regular guy. Um, so what else about the uh, about the business side of stuff? Uh, now, do you have you you have you don't have contracts with the guys, do you? Uh, so no, no, not not guys. not not yeah, not the members. We're all um, number one. Whatever we make, we split it. You know, five ways or six ways or however. You don't is. take out something for the band specifically for the. I mean, it depends. If we have something like if we're doing a video or something, it's just like so. This show is going to go pay for that or whatever. But in general, we kind of. Um, most shows, like, you know, we make X amount of dollars, it gets split, you know, five ways. Of the core members, if we have, if we get a keyboard player or a horn section, that's usually a predetermined price. Hey guys, can you play that? They're like more the hired guns for the show. But the core members, everyone splits evenly. People told me I, I haul around the PA system, I do, you know, a lot of the booking. Would you take a little more? Eh, you know, it just, it, it just, it just simpler, better if everyone just makes the same. It, it doesn't leave room, it leaves no room for, like, any sort of, uh, Simmering animosity or problems with money. You know, money is always a problem with people, or, you know. Well, so. musicians have an especially weird relationship with money because there's. This, we don't have a lot of it. Well, there's, yeah, there's <laughs> part of it. And so when, when, when we don't have a lot of it, we start to think it's honorable to be poor. Yeah. And they, but then when you think about it, you end up spending as much time uh, focusing on being poor as you would focus on actually making the money that you need to remove the restrictions of poverty, you know? Yeah. So. Um, and yeah, what you're, what you're saying there, are people are like, well, you you know, you call the PA, you book the gigs, and that kind of stuff. Uh, shouldn't you shouldn't you take more? There are, and there are bands that, that will do that. Yeah, it's a good deal. Like yeah. that's fine. That I just don't want to. Now, if, if uh, but you're the boss of the band. You final final decisions land on you if they need to be made. If there's yeah, if they need to be. We try to do democracy. Everyone gets their two cents. I ask, hey, do you want to do that? If it's a questionable gig, maybe pay wise or say, hey. This is what it is, or you know, are people going this far? Or, or, and I want everybody's input all the time, and 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 if I have to make a decision, then I will. But in general, we're usually all on the same page about it and everything. But I, and I want everyone's opinion. But you're not gonna you're not gonna go to them with a gig that doesn't pay as well if you're not willing to play it already. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
uh, in general, we try to set a minimal price, and sometimes I feel that you, you can compromise on that minimal price. You gotta have your value and stuff, and then we figure this is what it's worth for us to go out. But, you know, depending on, well, it's a good opportunity to, you know, hopefully in the future we'll maybe we'll pay more, but it's, it, it's a good region that we don't play or, or something. There, there's always, I think, reasons to just kind of, you know, compromise on what your, what your price is, depending on the situation. Is, is uh, the three things, right? Is it fun? Does it pay? And does it enhance your brand yeah. or that is your image? However you like to, whatever phrase you like to use. Um, uh, but uh, the other thing about setting a price, I think uh, that's important for people to understand is when you're not working for next to nothing in a venue you're not really excited about working in, mm -hmm. Uh, after all the hours and hours and hours and hours of practice time and years of building up an image and all this sort of thing, you know, if, if you don't have anything that's exciting you about it, then you end up resenting the work that you're doing. And you cannot afford to be resentful in the music industry because there's already so much that we could resent as, you know, about the way that, you know, uh, musicians could be treated or the way the record industry works or any number of other things. Uh, so when I when you say hey you know uh, just use a, a flat figure hey uh, we're worth a thousand dollars, it's half about the money. It's also half about saying we are worth whatever. We work at this level, yeah, and therefore we demand this level. We didn't just throw it together. Yeah, I mean, right. I've worked a lot. You've worked a lot. Other members in the band. It's a lot of work, and it's just the value of music. And you know, we we know how music is in value as much. You know. People don't really want to pay for stuff, and people just think, oh, "I'll play my party. Well, I'll, you know, give you some beers and fifty bucks." Like, well, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is this is how much it costs for this amount of time. For you know, and the the craft that I've had developed, and all the hours and hours of practicing. I don't use an iPad when I play. Uh, you know, and a lot of people do, and it, it limits me. But I just I have those two hundred and twenty whatever song in my head. I spent a lot of time wondering all those darn lyrics. And I, uh, I, I you bring up a really good point because yeah, people use the the tablets all the time um, and I, that opens a great opportunity for me to tell people don't yeah uh, you can use it as a reference give I have a I have a music stand that I keep around for some longer gigs especially so I have uh, to the side you know um, but you you can't read mm -hmm. and be engaged in the mm -hmm. music that's, and that's give your right. audience that's something exactly. uh, to a degree it can be uh, an aid but depending on that, I'm always annoyed when I see guitarists up there playing and then they're moving their tablet. It's like, are yeah. you even involved? Yeah, exactly. Come I on. mean, do the work that 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 everybody. And this is not old guy complaining thing. This yeah. is really be engaged in the music. If it matters that much to you, if you are connected to the music, you're not going to have that much yeah. of a you, trouble you, understanding. You, you, you remember, you remember perform better words. when you know it yeah. and you feel it instead of reading it. Now everyone makes their own choices, and if you have that, and somebody requests a song, you can just look it up, and you, you, you can give everybody kind of what they want, and maybe you can make some good tips, you know, oh, they'll give you that 20, and maybe there's some tip money that's gone out the window because I wasn't able to play whatever song they want, but it's like, eh, <laughs> uh, uh, it, you know, these are just decisions and things you have to, I'm a, I'm a stickler to that, and I just play guitar and sing when I play my solo stuff, and other people use other stuff, and that's fine for them. But me, I'm like, no, no iPad, because it, it, to me it's like a crutch, and like, yeah, you're reading, you're not performing as much. Right. You know, it's sort of like a quasi thing. Now, certain certain places, certain atmospheres, whatever, and everyone's gonna have to make that decision what what kind of you know performance they want to put on. And I, I want to put on a really engaging, you know, emotional music is emotion, right? And mm -hmm. you want to be connecting, and uh, I find it knowing the song. You perform at the best, and so you make a good a good point too. That because there may be situations where it's the kind of gig where using the tablet is perfectly okay. Yeah, you know, like uh, you know having a if you're, well, it's a wallpaper gig. You're playing background music. Yeah, when I get a wallpaper gig, yeah, then I've got my my book of songs and I'm sitting there and I'm reading and singing. But I, even then, I've, I've I'm familiar with them. This is just like I haven't looked at this song in a month. Uh, what, and when people, you, you also mentioned people, oh, I don't, what if I don't know, I don't, or I didn't know the song somebody asked for, or maybe I missed a tip or lost a tip or something. Uh, what, what do you do when people are coming over and making requests? So, number one, I have a book of like my 225 songs that I know. So I just recommend, hey guys, just look in the book. 
And now, uh, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes they don't want to do that. They just want to guess, and we're playing this fun game where I say, "Oh, sorry, oh, oh for six on your request." Oh, for six. Uh, I try to find something maybe comparable. Like if they ask for a certain band or something, I go, well, "I don't have that, but I have this." Yeah, I try to like. Because you do solo gigs too. Yeah, 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 I do. I do mostly. Yeah, I do mostly solo acoustic gigs. So that's yeah. what we're talking about here. And um, yeah, in, in that case, you know, I want to give people what they want. I mean, if, if the audience can just look through my book and just just read off, like I'll just be the human jukebox all night. That's great because I don't know because I I was like oh what do I play oh what do I play now oh I don't know and it, it, a lot of it is reading the room and it's like what is working is it an older crowd is it younger is it whatever and knowing what I think fits but boy if they just tell you it's a lot easier yeah right yeah so that's why I was like look in the book guys there's the book but you know and you have to make that decision whether you want to be the human ju jukebox or not yeah I like it personally but you know and, and, and other and people was like no I'm playing what I want so I'm like, okay that's fine and and that's me. Yeah. That's the choice I've, I've, I've made, but I've, ha I've had to tailor my work, my, my career to that. That people don't come to my show going, man, he does the greatest version of this Damien Rice song or something. You know, it's, you know, he, if, if there's any talk of, of covers, it's the way that I do them that to make them my own or something like that. But I've developed my career in that way, and that's something too that's important. People to always, to, to always keep in mind when you're developing a band, or, or, or which includes a solo act, you know, you're developing your act, we'll say. Um, be clear on what you are willing to do and what you are not willing to do, and don't base it on how quickly can I get my butt out there playing in front of people and how quickly can I make a buck doing it. Because you will get to a point where you start going, why am I playing this this kind of gig or that kind of gig? And, you know, this kind of, this stuff. Maybe one thing is getting getting out there and starting to get a sense of which kinds of gigs you, you enjoy and which kind of gigs you don't and that kind of stuff. Did you go through some of that? Did you experience, as you were getting out there, did you start to find what kinds of places you like playing and what kinds of places you don't? Yeah, I like playing the fun ones, you know, like where the uh, bar has a good amount of people all the time and they're engaged, but you're going to get, I, I do plenty of wallpaper gigs and it is what it is. I'm making money and I don't think, even when you're having like a kind of lame gig, uh, you're just there playing for three hours and you don't, you're not getting much, people are just kind of talking, and, but afterwards they'll sometimes say, oh, you, you sounded great, oh, you were great, you that's, know, because yeah. I think sometimes they don't want to be that one person like, uh, you know, they feel awkward being that one clapper or whatever. Yeah. And, and just because they're talking and everyone, they're still hearing and listening. And if you're not getting that, um, I, I, that was something I had to get over, though, in the beginning. When the first couple shows, if they're not reacting, it really kind of bugged me. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. they don't like it. And then after a while, you just go, oh, that's, that's how it is sometimes. And let's say maybe they don't, they don't even like it. I, I hope they don't. I, I hope that's not the case. But, but I just, you know, I made money playing music for three hours. Oh God! There's so many worse things to do yeah, for, for a job. Yeah. But every time you kind of get down, or it's like a, feels like a lame gig, you just got to tell yourself, Psh. you know, it's better than digging a ditch, or painting a wall, or you know, working in an office, which I did do for a long time, and I make a lot less money now, but I'm way happier. And I mean, you know, hours per week that I work, um, you know, at least officially as playing gigs, you know, work is also practice in the booking and so forth. But yeah, it's a it, it's it's a trade off that I that I that I like, you know, and uh, so. Um, the booking aspect, going back to the business thing, the booking aspect is the part that's the biggest pain. Um, but it's you, you got to do it because you got to book the gigs to make the money, and it's just the reaching the people and different managers come in and out and venues close or bars close, and it's just it's a constant struggle to sort of uh, to, to to get in touch with everyone and book all the gigs and you know it'd be nice if somebody did it for me all the time, but then you got to pay them a percentage and you know. So. Well, um, you also. With places that don't close, you develop a relationship with certain yeah. places too, and that's what businesses uh, in 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 music or anywhere else is. A, it's a matter of creating relationships with people, just like with the band, right? You create a relationship with the guys in the band. Um, you create a relationship with the places that book you. You create a relationship yeah. with your audience, yeah. and so where you have developed these relationships of trust and mutual, mutually beneficial, you know, gigs. Uh, you you have something that you can consistently depend on and you can consistently build on, you know. Um, as, as you've developed your work as both a solo artist and with a band, have there been other people in your life that, are, that, have, that have been involved who are not part of the band 
Uh, have there been any uh, you know, relationships outside the band that you have to contend with as a musician? Because, you know, we keep different hours, right? Yeah. I've got to make my wife's an actor, you know, so yeah. we, we like keep very similar hours and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, have other people been involved who are not music musical? Have you run into problems with that? Have you learned lessons from that? Have you uh, gained from that? Or has it just never been an issue because Mark does his own thing? Well, you know, uh, it is it is limiting as far as dating, I will say, because, um, you know, say, you know, most people do their nine to fives, um, you know, and then they go out on the weekend. Well, I'm working every weekend. So, you know, you end up... Uh, you know, you meet the people in the bars that will maybe work in the industry, sort of, and, and maybe something, you know, happens there. But it's just, to, 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 I remember I did the, like, online dating years ago, and, you know, you meet up with them, and, and, and whatever, and they got a normal job, and you got a weekend job, and it's like, oh, when are you guys going to go out, you know? So <laughs> it's just, yeah. that, that, that's, that's an issue, but it's just like, well, you know, well, whatever. I love what I'm doing, and, uh, you know, that'll sort itself out if you find somebody, whatever. But it definitely is, you know, as far as the, what I do, the weekend cover working musician thing, Thursday, Friday, Saturday is playing a lot. Um, it's, it does, it's an it's a issue if, if, if maybe you're trying to date somebody that's a more, more straight schedule. But, um, of course, yeah. in the gig economy, you might run into people who have as much freedom as yeah, you do yeah. as far as schedule. Yeah, it's getting more common and all that, but, you know. Um, what are some major lessons you feel you've learned? Things that you on you, you, you on an ongoing basis or, or on a regular basis you find you go back to uh, some lesson you learned that helps you keep your head on straight or anything like that? Uh, you know, I still struggle with it, but don't get frustrated with um, maybe you were playing a place for a while and then now you're not playing there anymore because maybe now there's a different manager that's doing the booking and they don't know you. Like you're talking about that relationship. Mm -hmm. You establish these relationships and then they go poof. And you're like, yeah. uh, and then like, and I played there for years. I'm not playing there anymore. And you just have frustrations with the booking. I mean, you'll be frustrated like in life and everything. You just kind of just got to kind of roll with it. Uh, got to let it roll off your back. Hey, sort it, of. Is it any less frustrating than uh, going to a job you hate? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, you know, it what depends. Mean? I mean, at, always in the moment you can be like, ah, this is making me mad. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, it, it's uh, I know I'm happy with my work and what I'm doing and my life you know, as it is right now. So whatever complications arise, you just got to gotta kind of go with it. You know, that's just a life. So you're, that's just a life. You're, you know, you're, learning, you're learning to process the frustration differently. It sounds yeah. Like. You're learning to say, I, uh, uh, hey, this is part of the work that I do, and uh, I got to remind myself this is why, I, you know, I, I, or the music is why I do it. I, I chose to do this. Uh, I, I remember, you know, making more money, or having more structure, perhaps, but I don't remember being this happy. I mean, these are some of the things that I yeah. say these things myself, you know. Too. Consistent, it's, consistent it's, paycheck was nice. That's yeah. really nice to know what you're getting every two weeks, yeah. every month, you know. And this is up and down, and it's and some months. Every winter it slows down, and every winter comes, and I get like, oh man, <laughs> where are the gigs? I'm, I'm broke, you know. And and I've been doing this for like uh, I don't know nine years or so, like you know solely, and. I still don't get used to that part, but uh, you know, there's there's just little things that are going to bother you, and you just got to keep going because ultimately, I feel I'm on the right path, and I'm you know enjoying it, you know, most of the time. The, the, you've been doing it nine years. Uh, what was it made you take the the leap? Oh, getting getting laid off. I, yeah, yeah, see, yeah. I, think <laughs> I, I think I knew that. That's the, that's the funny thing. I mean, yeah. I, and I never. It was a nice. It was a good steady. Job it paid well, it and I never went. When the economy, yeah, the economy went crashed, and everyone was getting laid off. I right. took that as an opportunity, and I didn't know if I could do it. I was thinking maybe I'd have to teach, and I ultimately didn't go that route. I, I booked enough gigs, and uh, but yeah, it was it was a big unknown. But I I know I know one guy that did quit. It. A couple guys quit their because they're just so unhappy with the job, and, and um, they just quit their job to do the music. And I was like, oh, I wasn't that brave. I mean, maybe I would have gotten to a point as well, <laughs> but at the, but at the time, it just it just the opportunity arose, and I was like, well, "Let's try it," but yeah, it's hard to it's hard to give up that consistency unless you're miserable, and you know, then then you're gonna be more inclined to go, "What? Well, I need to try something else because I'm just so unhappy in this." Something something that I, I you know that that I did that a lot of other people have done and do is gradually 
uh, uh, phase out. Phase out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. I was looking for that word to gradually phase out the uh, the 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 day job or the other work that you're doing and and, and continue to just replace it with other consistent forms of, of work and music. Um, it does take a while to build. Like, so in the beginning, does, yeah. I only had a couple, and it, it took, and I, I like think I had like a severance and stuff, and it just allowed me a little bit of transition phase. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it took like a year or two or so to get sort of like a sort of more consistent, uh, steady thing and get those relationships with those venues and bars. And well, and the and the fact that you got the the the, the economy crashing. Um, led you to a career in music is a really great example of how hardship in life responded to in the right way can be beneficial. That, you know, that you were put in a position yeah, where it, was it like, wasn't good news when it when yeah. I heard about it. I was like, oh no, I'm losing my job. You yeah. know? And that's how most people probably react. You know? Well, and, and, and yeah, it, 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 I, mean, I remember that's why I brought it up. I remember when that happened. So it's made me think of it. I was like, he said nine years. And I thought back, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. You lost your job. With, for so long, they, they were you know downsizing everywhere, right? Yeah. And you weren't the only person I was, you know, teaching at the time who, who you know, who got laid off. It was everywhere. But you took it and you said, "Well, here's my opportunity. I may as well uh, take the leap now, at least as far as I could tell." Right? Did, where did you think it was going to take you? What would you tell somebody in a similar uh, position right now? Uh, they, their, their job lays them off, or their job is ending. There's a lot of contract-related work, for instance, now, right? Uh, maybe uh, somebody writes code, but it's on contract, and the gig's up in a few months, but they started gigging, you know, playing music out, and that kind of stuff, and then here it comes. What would you tell somebody put in that kind of position uh, uh, to focus on in order to keep their head on straight? Um, you know, if you do... Love them. Number one, you have to love music. You know, yeah. you know that's that's a given. But if you do love it and and you want to do it, I always definitely try to pursue it. Um, you know, because the opportunities are out there. There's a lot of places to play. Go out, talk to other musicians. You know, go see them play. Uh, pick up on you know kind of what they do, how they approach their stuff. But but it is de it's definitely possible um, as long as you love it. Because you're gonna have to put work in, and and there's gonna be a lot of work, you know, learning the songs and doing all the booking and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, in the beginning, you don't really know. Uh, you know, I, I definitely didn't think I'd get to a point. I mean, there there's some months where I made like a, a good chunk of change for a month, and I was like, holy! I never could have imagined that I'd have this many paying this this well and stuff. But it, it takes a while. Like when you start out, you're 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 playing for maybe you know a hundred dollars a gig, and then if it gets up to two hundred, two fifty, sometimes private things, three hundred bucks or something. I I, I played one, I got like five hundred dollars for some like lawyer, like you know law office Christmas party thing, mm -hmm. and I was like, wow, that's actually the, that's, I think that's the most I've got paid for a solo gig, and I, I wish there were more of those, but well, there it's it's out there, and 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 it just in the beginning it's going to be a little tough and frustrating, and you know, kind of like I don't know what to do or how to do this, but you know because yeah, some guys ask me. Hey, what do I do? It's like, well, start. I don't know. I can use some places. Call. No, you got to have music online that they can listen to um, when you when you contact these people. But um, that demonstrates your live show. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least, or at least so they can go. Or at least they can know what they, you sound like. I think they probably prefer videos where they can like see you uh, and uh, you know studio magic. You know, everyone can sound good. This not everyone, but you know. But I, videos, videos, I think are a little bit better if you can get yourself a couple of videos of you playing some some songs or whatever. But um. so you talked about all the different aspects of this work. Uh, a, a half a dozen things you rattled off that you have to do in order to establish a band or or work as a solo artist or both. And uh, only one of them referred to the music, and it came down to be sure you love the music. Of course, uh, all the years I've been teaching and coaching people in music, I always ask them, why did you get into this? And you know, with rare exception, it, it's because, well, I could, what kind of dumb question is that? You know, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, and when somebody is like, well, you know, when they answer with, especially with that kind of phrase, I couldn't imagine doing anything else, I know they're on the right track, I know that they're gonna be willing to do the work, because you just demonstrated by the number of things you rattled off, there was a whole lot of work involved 
and unseen work that people don't kind of realize. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Would you say like ninety percent of the work is done by the time you hit the stage? Oh yeah, uh, for sure. And yeah, like the, the show. Oh, that's that's easy. Yeah, right. <laughs> because because you've done all the work, you've done all the practice, you learned all the songs, you booked it, you know, whatever. And then you know, you, I mean, you set up the PA usually, like I have to in the bars. But I the shows where you just show up and they plug you in. That's the best. But anyways, yeah, the, the show is not really that. The show is the fun. Yeah. You know. You know. It's that's, and that that that's always fun. always I think something that's important for people to understand too that the the, the show is the result of a, a great deal of work. You don't just you don't just walk up on a stage and people. I just want to I just want to jam, man. I just want to play. Yes. Well, there's a whole lot of work being in, in 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 getting to the point where you can just jam or just play. Bands that, for instance, that are really good at jamming and improvisation, actually are dealing with a whole great deal of structure even in the improvisational process because there are all these patterns involved and they're extremely well-trained musicians in order to react quickly to complex changes uh, which could be a great uh, you know metaphor analogy whatever the word is for what you did when the economy crashed and you got downsized and you you know dealt with skill uh, to a complex change in your life and said, well, here it goes. And then you learned a complex set of skills in order to treat your, your work in music as, as a business. And uh, it's like a dirty word for musicians. But again, if you want creative freedom, do what we do. You know? I, I'm able to do myself whatever I want musically. Yeah. But I've worked hard to get to this this point, and it's the same thing as you're saying, like, oh, I want to, you know, oh, I can't wait to get more than five hundred on a solo gig, and you will, especially as you continue to establish yourself with a reputation for, for rocks off, uh, and as a solo uh, performer, you get to where you can start to demand more, and you know, uh, and get it because it, you will continue to be working at a higher uh, level. And then there's also there's sensible math involved, people. If you get a the really big paying gig, you don't say, oh, they get, they paid me five hundred bucks to play for an hour. I make five hundred dollars an hour. Yeah, I like no, you didn't. That. How many gigs did you play this month? If I played four gigs this month, and one of them was for five hundred, and the other three were for three hundred, I just made fourteen hundred dollars this month and barely above the poverty yeah. line. That's the way you have to approach it so that you do make it through the winter, you know, so literally and figuratively. Yeah. Um, and so that you also are in a position to uh, expand on the work that you're doing. What you're doing with Rocks Off, I like that you're splitting it amongst all the, the, the band members, and I think that that's made possible. You're doing it clearly for management purposes. You know, you feel like, it's, and, and for personal, I think, too, is if you feel like it's the right thing to do, right? It's fair. Right. It seems like a fair thing. It would be just as fair for you to say there's one extra band member, it's called production costs. Yeah. And that that's not unfair. Occasionally, also, I will say some for advertising if, like, you know, out of the tip jar or something, but in general, I kind of absorb some. And you bring it to those guys. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, hey, you're, I, need, you're, I need this for that. But your solo work allows you to do that as well. Your solo work, I think, supplements your ability to do that because you're able to run your whole business. Uh, 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 of, of music, your whole career of music around the solo work and the band, so that you you can uh, you can offer the band that that little benefit, you know. And I think that that's a good thing to be able to do as well. And when when we can look at that whole picture, then we can also make those kinds of decisions. Uh, th that well, I I I I feel it's fair for the band to all get paid this way. There were times I came out of pocket. Pay band. Yeah, well, yeah. In order to keep quality artists backing me up so that my reputation as yeah. a, a, a musician would not be damaged by having, you know, uh, halfway musicians behind me. In fact, I've always strived to have artists that are more skilled, at least in my head, than I am. Yeah, I had to do that. I mean, going to the I do original music as well, occasionally. Yes. Not as much as I should. Yes, uh, I covered one of your songs. Yeah. So we have a video thing going too. Right behind us is my uh, uh, the poster for my album, The Unsung. And the first song on it is No Closer to Home, which is the title track from your solo album. You got another one coming out? 
been working on that? Oh, I mean, I've been working on it since then, and um, the writing has been sporadic, and uh, work on it. Maybe I'll do an EP, maybe I'll just go in and record and just do like singles, you know, this is all about singles, like it, it goes full circle. In, uh, in digital digital music, yeah, you can do you can do singles all day long. I never put out a single until like the last a couple of years. Recording music started as singles, too, you know, yeah, until, they, they until they're like, oh, now we have these bigger albums, we can put more music on them, but... But uh, yeah, I'm working on it. But, but this job allows me the time to write. I just yeah. know, haven't been been doing it as often as I should. You know, write, write, writing is is hard. But uh, but because I have lots of free time and um, I have the time to do it, as opposed to you know you work all week and you come home and you're tired and you know. Uh, but um, it, it, it's it's a nice to be able to do both. I just need to do the original stuff more. That's my artistic expression. You know, the, the, we want to talk about making money in original music. Well, I don't. I'm not well versed in that because that's 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 the hard thing. I'll you, do you it. Know, I'm, you know. I'm sure I'll do yeah, it. Sure yeah, on that. Yeah. Uh, about you know, yeah. at some point, I, we have a list of things. I mean, we um, we can you know gripe about all that, but you know, yeah. But griping doesn't do anything no. unless you're identifying a problem. And my view of identifying a problem is this: if you can identify a problem, then there is a solution, or you wouldn't be able to mathematically discern that there's a problem. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's like if humans created the world that they live in, then they can solve its problems. Uh, you know, and, and that's like at a grander scale. In our little world, uh, and it is a little world as independent musicians, we we have the answers. Uh, it, and so identify the problem and then go solve it. But complaining, don't waste your energy in that. You got better things to do. The music is more important than our than our, our complaints. Well, if you complain, complain in the form of a song. Right, there you go. <laughs> Write a song about it, you know. So I want to thank you, Mark, for joining me today. It's great to see you, my friend. And uh, I tell everybody to catch up with Mark and hear Rocks Off by visiting rocksofftribute.com. That's where we are. We're also you? on Facebook at Rocks Off Tribute. You know, Facebook, Rocks, I don't know what it is, but you know, Facebook you'll find it. Instagram, uh, Rocks Off Tribute, we're on there. I'm on Instagram, Mark Taylor, Facebook. You know, just... Google search stuff. Yeah. Mark, Mark Taylor, Rocks Off, Chicago. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank uh, my producer, advisor, uh, Kalfani, back here, sitting patiently watching us and twisting knobs. Hmm. Uh, so that is it for the Working Circle for this month. I am Phil Circle. We will talk about booking from the artist perspective, how to get your first gig, the types of venues available, and how to level up your performance. Until then, you can connect with me at philcirclemusic.com, Phil Circle Music on Instagram, Phil Circle on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. I'm everywhere. Man. Well, yeah, LinkedIn, uh, that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm on it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know how much reason you have for no, working no, on there. Yeah, no. this my, the, 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 I have enough things now that I, yeah. I can treat that. So thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful morning, evening, daytime, whatever it is when you're listening to this. Thanks for checking in. Peace. Cool. Hope that was uh, what you're looking for. Yeah.